In 1999, a radical new series debuted on HBO, a gangster series told from the mobster's perspective. It was about family and the family. It's also a show that had a very controversial final episode. Anyway, we'll try to resist the temptation to do silly, joisy accents and end every paragraph with forget about it. It's not the baritones, the tenors or the altos, it's the sopranos. In the beginning, there was television. In the US, TV meant either a network affiliate or an independent channel, often screening syndicated repeats of F Troop. And then there was pay TV. In the US, there was a premium channel called Home Box Office, whose main selling point was that it had big movies, commercial free, and pay-per-view sporting events like boxing matches. It was also not operating under the same content restrictions as network television. So if people wanted to say, for example, the word fuck, they could or shit, pits, tits, and c flaps, if they so desired. They could also show nudity, sex, and much more violent material than the networks, since there were no advertisers to worry about offending. So if I wanted to say, fuck, or show a long hanging dong, or a huge pair of tits, or a Chevrolet Malibu hanging brick hooks, I technically could, but you'll just have to use your fucking imagination. David Chase was an Italian-American writer who started off on spooky horror show Kolchak and later worked on shows like The Rockford Files and Northern Exposure. In the mid-90s, he came up with the premise of a show about a fucking mobster who goes into therapy, based partly on his own experiences, the therapy part, not the mobster bit. As an Italian-American, he wanted to see a show about people from an Italian-American background, Italian-American gangsters, and not the whitewashed type he'd been forced to write for on network television, mafia guys called Anderson. So as not to incur the wrath of Italian-American groups who hated that mob movies informed the Italian stereotype among Americans more than the song Shut Up A You Face. The show was pitched to the major US networks who, seeing its potential as quality television, passed on it. HBO, then not thought of as an obvious place to make a serious drama, ordered a pilot which was filmed in 1997. David Chase was ambivalent about a series pickup order since it was his hope that with a little more cash he could film a few more scenes and turn the pilot into a feature film. Irony of ironies, the series that flipped the switch of there being better dramas on television than in cinemas was almost itself a one-off movie. There was a fucking gap before HBO finally ordered 12 more shows to make up a full season, which debuted in early 1999. A few months before Analyze This, a comedy about a mobster in therapy. And I saw Analyze This. Analyze This? Most mobster movies were often set in the usual f***ing locations like New York, Chicago, Las Vegas, or even Los Angeles. But The Sopranos would be unique and that it was set in f***ing New Jersey. Jersey? Come on, huh? Officially known as the Garden State. But gardening is not the first thing that springs to mind when most people talk about New Jersey. The Sopranos is not a fucking comedy, but it has a wicked sense of humor. It's not a family drama, but there's a lot of that there as well. It's not always about people getting whacked, but there's enough of that to satisfy you. Apart from the people who always wanted less yakking, more whacking. Tony Soprano is a capo regime, or captain, in the New Jersey Mafia. He's successful, lives in a big house with a wife and two children, and things are going well. Except underneath it all, he's been suffering from panic attacks, which see him referred to a psychiatrist. Throughout the series run, Tony gains insight into his psychological problems stemming from his fraught relationship with his parents. My penis falls off. Growing up with a mobster for a father and a monster for a mother. But this is a f***ing HBO show. He doesn't become a better person. What are you gonna do? As time goes on, he becomes more ruthless and less empathetic. No matter how much help I gave, you'd still be here fucking complaining. At best, Tony comes to understand himself a little better. His impulse control is almost non-existent. He's a serial philanderer, and his temper is as likely to flare up as a barbecue doused with vodka. Tony Soprano, or Soprano, you can say it both ways. Mr. Soprano? Was a career-defining role for James Gandolfini. A role he inhabited so well that it's hard not to see hints of Tony Soprano in other things Gandolfini appeared in, like Crimson Tide or In The Loop. Tony, like almost every other character, is a sociopath, which means he's selfish and lacks empathy with others for the most part. Every now and then, he manages to feel for someone else's situation, so long as it doesn't impact on him. Also, I don't think he had the makings of a varsity athlete. The show weaves together Tony's mob life and his home life, and we see how one influences the other. When Tony opens up to his shrink, 
Dr. Jennifer Melfi, played by Lorraine Brocco, who was the best-known actor when the show premiered on account of her having already starred in Goodfellas. You have strong feelings about this. Let me tell you something. I had a semester and a half for college, so I understand Freud. Melfi has her own problems, some of which are caused by her association with her patient, others are just regular family problems. I need to buy a couple of expensive books. Melfi and Tony have a deal. Tony doesn't give away too many details about his criminal activities and she won't go to the cops. Watching Tony explain to Melfi what's happening in his life in a roundabout way that sometimes echoes events but at other times completely misrepresents the facts shows the confluence of the mostly excellent writing and always excellent performances from the main cast in this show. Is it enough of a sad tragedy that you can join the rest of the douchebags? The therapy scenes have the potential to be the dullest aspect of a show that features copious amounts of mobster violence. But somehow these scenes, though often long, rarely drag. I'm content, I'm relaxed. Bottom line is I'm a better husband and a better father. Melfi dealing with the curiosity and disapproval of her peers and family is interesting. And you can just see how most people are clearly fascinated by the hint of somebody being connected to the mafia. Soprano. Tony Soprano? He's your patient? <sighs> Wow. That's pretty cool. Carmela Soprano is Tony's wife. In some ways, she's his long-suffering partner. In other ways, insufferable herself. What's different between you and me is you're going to hell when you die. In a show full of Catholic characters, she is by far the most dogmatic and devout person in the series. Carmela tends to think of things in black and white, but she herself vacillates between feeling extreme guilt about her life and just plain ignores her own complicity in Tony's illegal businesses. She is constantly feeling inner turmoil, yet ignores every piece of advice telling her to just walk away and leave the blood money behind. One thing you can never say that you haven't been told. When she does leave Tony for a time, she won't leave without her share of the spoils. Fucking shit bag! Don't come up here! Get the fuck out of this house! Whereas similar female characters, oh, <coughs> Skylar White, <coughs> seem to have brought with them lynch mobs out for blood on social media, Edie Falco makes this role one of the more compelling characters. You don't always like Carmella, but you never want to see her hurt, nor do you really want to see her and Tony split up. <coughs> Skylar White. <coughs> Meadow Soprano is the eldest Soprano child, a little brattish during her teen years, but she's determined to go her own way in life, despite her, at times, fractious relationship with her parents. Are you in the Mafia? She constantly modulates between accepting and rejecting her family's background. She's not without her flaws, she's the character with their head on the straightest. Anthony Jr., also known as AJ, is different. So what, no f***ing ZD now? He's spoiled, shiftless, selfish, and not all that bright. He's like Tony was at that age, but without the toughness or street smarts. Compared to their hopes for Meadow, Tony and Carmela's ambitions for AJ drastically scale back over the course of the series. Like how you were once angry about the lack of a headphone jack on your latest phone, but now you make do with crappy Bluetooth headphones that are out of sync with the sound on your movie. Meadow wants to keep her family's business activities at arm's length, but in later years, AJ almost embraces it, trading off on the mobster image since it seems to be the only way anyone finds him interesting. Zazu said to tell you he's honored to have you on the club. And please, regards to your dad. AJ, being a thankless kid role who doesn't get to whack anybody, almost certainly a character many in the audience hated, simply because he was just a clueless and inept kid that nobody really wanted to admit was them at that same age. Oh Some Christ, I parked and leave. <laughs> The family grows over time. The kids go through high school and enter college. Carmela eventually loses patience with Tony's infidelity and leaves, but comes back after it becomes apparent she won't be able to extract much from a divorce settlement. Eventually they make a sort of peace with who they are and where they are in life. Like when you first have to get glasses to read and you use them only sparingly at first, but eventually wear them the whole time, even when you don't need to. And now f***ing hell, everything is blurry all the goddamn time. The first year in particular is dominated by Tony Tony's toxic relationship with his aging mother, Livia, who may or may not be aware of the effects of her words. I suppose I should have just kept my mouth shut, like a mute, and then everybody would have been happy. Is The Sopranos full of Italian stereotypes, or are they archetypes? Well, there's no Papa Giuseppe, no one wearing a Dolmio grin, or a giant moustache, 
or a heavy set mama walking around dressed all in black. The stereotypes on offer are those where the overlapping tropes of Italian Americans and the people of New Jersey meet. Big hair, tasteless clothes, too much makeup and tacky jewellery. The characters in this show eat Italian food almost exclusively, in particular ungodly amounts of pasta. James Gandolfini must have absolutely hated the sight of pasta by the end of this series. Christopher is somehow Tony's nephew, but also cousin. Tony is protective of him and mentors him in the ways of what they call this thing of theirs. Chris, in many ways, is a younger version of Tony, equally hot-headed and impulsive, but his drug addiction is holding him back from achieving his full potential as a sociopathic monster. How about the Cuban Missile Crisis? Cocksuckers moved nuclear warheads into Cuba, pointed them right at us. That was real? I saw that movie. I thought it was bullshit. For much of the series, his girlfriend Adriana, a truly long-suffering character, tries to curb his worst excesses while she waits for their long-delayed wedding. Your office, your club, your cocaine. It's not my cocaine. Really? That's not what I have you saying on tape. She puts up with a lot from Christopher. Last week when I came home to learn that you had killed our dog, that was the final straw. Oh. And endures a fairly tragic journey after being forced to cooperate with the FBI. Drea De Matteo also endured a tortuous journey, originally cast as a day player, Christopher, bumped up the series regular, Christopher, winning an Emmy, Christopher, and then co-starring in Joey. <coughs> Paulie is of the old school. You got some balls, my friend. Like somebody you would have seen as a kid in the wedding at the first Godfather movie, he's now grown up into an angry old man who is yet to retire. The guy you're looking for is an ex-commando. He killed 16 Chechen rebels single-handed. Yeah, nice, huh? He was with the Interior Ministry. He killed 16 Czechoslovakians. Guy was an interior decorator. The skip seeing a psychiatrist. How's that sit with your ass? I usually do sit with my ass. Why don't you sit with yours? Silvio is Tony's consigliere. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. His chief advisor and owner of the strip club, the Bada Bing, where a lot of the crew hangs out in their downtime. Tony's uncle Junior, or Corrado Soprano, starts off the series as Tony's main antagonist, but legal and health issues prove to be his downfall, and he spends most of the series under house arrest awaiting trial. Uncle June, how was Boca? Wonderful. I don't go down enough. That's not what I heard. His relationship with Tony is sort of a begrudging respect, despite them often clashing over policy and money. Flight risk. I've been farting into the same sofa cushion for the last 18 months. Janice is Tony's older sister, a scheming ex-hippie who still dreams of doing big things, but tends to big note herself at every opportunity. Where is my leg? Your leg? Uh, oh yeah, where's your... I know you took it. <laughs> That's preposterous. I mean, what possible use would I have for your leg? Janice is self-aware in some ways, but totally self-delusional in others. It's a case of being able to see problems in others, but not yourself. So Janice is basically a human analogue of a Twitter account. Bobby is Junior's keeper before being promoted to captain, later becoming Janice's husband, the poor bastard. Steve Sharipa wore a fat suit under the shirts, and I'm wearing a fat suit right now. It's comfortable and hard wearing and warm in the winter. Let me get off my car before you flip it over, you fat fuck. There's longtime friend and former record producer slash exploiter, Hesh. There's good and there's not good, this is not good. Furio, an Italian import who develops a crush on Carmella. Oh. The book -a -bar. The book -a -bar. There's also New York mobster Johnny Sack. You either deliver that prick to my door, or I will rain a shitstorm down on you and your family like you have never fucking seen. And the FBI are mostly represented by agents Harris, Cicerone, Lipari, San Severino, and Bureau Chief Frank Cubitoso. Maybe during the discovery phase of his RICO trial, we can inform his lawyer that Tony needs a plumber. There's Artie and Charmaine, restaurateurs and childhood friends of Tony and Carmella. Charmaine wants to keep the mobsters at arm's length, while Artie wants to flirt around the sides, often getting pitifully burned in the process. When you blew up the restaurant, you made me party to a criminal conspiracy. Did you ever stop to think about that? The Sopranos makes you like these people and root for them to win. You sympathize when they're down, but with few exceptions, they're almost all capable of and guilty of violent crimes, vicious assaults and murders. The plots of each season of The Sopranos tend to go along the same lines. Tony has a thorn in his side, usually from a business associate, and that tends to put Tony in a difficult position that gets resolved by the end of the season. Rinse and repeat. How many major shoot down last week? And then a new difficult associate pops up out of thin air at the next season. At least in this environment, it's easily explained by having people get out of jail. It's really about the journey and what 
watching the characters, of whom there are an awful lot. They're a ragtag bunch of walking stereotypes that can also subvert your expectations. Just this one time, I'll let you ask me about my affairs. Some of the cast are familiar from other mobster classics like Goodfellas or The Godfather. Like Janko Olive Oil. Yeah, it's like Janko. And there are references to these movies all the time by the various characters. In one, Mo Green's eyes got too big for his stomach, so they put a small caliber in his eye. Kids in school think it's actually kind of neat. It's in The Godfather, right? Not really. Casino, we like. Marty! Kundun! I liked it! In the first season, the power play between Tony and his uncle Junior took center stage, with Tony's mother and Junior's sister-in-law, Livia, poisoning the well to make matters worse. Cunnilingus and psychiatry brought us to this. Season two gave us Richie April, brother of a previous boss. I'm threatening you. I got a hot arm for you already. Richie is small and intense and ready with violence. He quickly becomes Tony's main rival and engaged to Jenna Soprano, but, oh, never mind. The third season saw Ralphie Cifaretto just appearing as though he's been there all along. Ralphie is also small and intense and quick with violence. They didn't have flat tops in ancient Rome! But he has a vicious sense of humour, not necessarily a nice sense of humour. I had to keep my mouth shut. Uh, unless, of course, there's a slimy sandwich around. And he's incredibly selfish and self-centered. No mean feat with these characters. You're late. Well, tomorrow I can be on time. But you'll be stupid forever. Ralphie manages to make it almost through two whole seasons. The fourth season sees Ralphie let off the chain. We see just how incredibly screwed up he is, but still an absolute arsehole. And let's be honest and use the correct scientific terminology here. A complete and utter piece of shit. Ah! Season 5 introduced us to the recently paroled Tony Blundetto, Anthony's favourite cousin. Where's Tubbs? <laughs> Tony B wants to go straight and become a licensed massage therapist for most of the season, before deciding, screw this, working for a living is for schmucks. I think when I got out of the joint, they thought an airbag was Polly Walnuts. And he takes on an unsanctioned hit, the aftermath of which would guide the drama for the rest of the series. You gotta let that dry before you put on a second coat. Steve Buscemi, normally a standard actor in so many of his roles, blends in well up against the powerhouse Sopranos cast. Our true enemy has yet to reveal himself. But the final villain, well, you know, they're almost all villain, but the final big bad was where they saved the best worst for last. The series' final antagonist is Phil Leotardo. Anybody ever die in your arms, you cocksucker? A family member, somebody you love? No. Well, give it time. See if I can't make that happen for you. Phil's a New York mobster who becomes the New York boss in the final season. He's best described as intransigent. He will just not move from his point of view or let anything go. Let it go, Phil. Phil is ruthless, merciless, violent, and so convinced his viewpoint is reasonable and right that he interprets that as a license to do and say whatever the hell he wants, because he is right. The show always had great actors in the bigger roles, but Frank Vincent is truly the man you'd love to hate. That was our name originally, Leonardo. But many years ago, when my grandpa came over from Sicily, they changed it at Ellis Island to Leotardo. Why did they do that for? Because they're stupid, that's why. So why do these thorns in Tony's side last past the end of the first episode where they cross Tony? Basically, are made guys like being a member of a loyalty rewards program. You don't get a car that gets you discounts on a range of products or air miles, but it's basically a shield from other mobsters. I'm a made guy! Of course, they always end up being killed. By the time The Sopranos was made, the FBI had coordinated their investigations into various crime families much better, allowing the main players to conduct their business while rock-solid cases were built up. This meant not busting the major players for relatively minor crimes until they had a solid case for the major felonies. The idea was to put together a RICO case. I'm because of RICO. Is he your brother? The RICO Act stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization, but it basically meant organized crime like the Mafia rather than other corrupt organizations like, I don't know, we'll take your pick. Part of the process of building up a major RICO case against the mob bosses is to coerce minor mob players into providing information and possibly testifying in exchange for things like immunity from prosecution or lesser sentencing or entering the witness protection program, like an asshole. Want me to wear a wire? Why not? You need batteries? Let's go right over here to Office Depot. Throughout the series, we find that various players have flipped, including Big Pussy, who's discovered and clipped, Adriana, who confesses and is clipped, as well as many of the other captains. Gangsters' paranoia regarding informants is strong, and for Tony in particular, it's palpable. Like bathroom visits after attending a chili cook-off. Would you forget our captain? Why don't you call for help in your radio mic, you f***ing 
rat. Part of the strategy to maintain discipline within the mafia is to have dirt on your friends. And the best way to keep them in line was to witness them killing someone, which was believed to be the best leverage against rats. They disrespected a proud Italian heritage and named us after a ballet costume. Marissa? That's for modern. In ballet, you wear tutus. It doesn't make a difference. That's right, it doesn't. There are other storylines weaved throughout the episodes, like the tragic journey of discovery of Vito, who realises he's a gay man in an incredibly homophobic world, Tony disapproving of Meadow's mixed-race boyfriend, Carmela's affair with AJ's college advisor, which turns sour due to her insistence on speaking to him about her son's college application straight after sex, Christopher's flirtations with Hollywood lead him to a network with John Favreau, and later, Sir Ben Kingsley, and co-produce a low-budget horror film, Cleaver, with a not-so-subtle version of Tony as the main antagonist. What? Son Tzu, the Chinese Prince Machiavelli. Tony turned me on to <laughs> Zhu. Zhu. Son Zhu, you fucking ass kiss. <laughs> These are not educated people, but they would all like to appear intelligent. You know, Quasimodo predicted all this. Nostradamus. Quasimodo's the hunchback of Notre Dame. Hilariously mangling the English language. He could technically not have penis contact with Hovalbo. Mixing metaphors like a concussed sports commentator. Create a little dysentery among the ranks. As soon as he saw me, he took off like a bat on a hill. The dean of getting it almost right is Carmine Jr. What happened at Coco's restaurant? This alteration you had with him. You're at the precipice, Tony, of an enormous crossroad. I'm glad you caught that, Alexandra. Very observant. The sacred and the propane. Now, I won't call it a sit-down because of the inclement negative implications. Now, for whatever reason, certain incidents have expired lately that have an adverse impact on our respective bottom lines. I know Vito's bottom was impacted, if that's what you're referring to. If you're expecting a treatise on toxic masculinity, it's on brutal display here in The Sopranos. Let's go with the satin finish. These are unreconstructed men who glory in their misogyny, racism, and homophobia. Doctor says, you have a cataract. The Chinaman says, no, I have a rink in continental. The show itself, in the days before streaming, was an early example of the box set phenomenon. Before DVDs, only some very popular shows qualified for having every episode released on videotape. You could buy most episodes of a TV show like Star Trek or Doctor Who on video cassette, but each cassette might only contain an episode or two if you're lucky. Your father never had the makings of a varsity athlete. Looking back, People who wanted to own a copy of a show they liked legally were chiseled like a life-size statue of a blue whale. The advent of DVD brought with it, eventually, the concept of a DVD box set, where instead of buying episodes on individual discs, you'd buy a whole season. I gotta have the whole story flow. The Sopranos being broadcast on HBO was only available legally to subscribers of that channel, a small proportion of the overall viewing audience. So box sets became a way to bring in non-subscribers who could watch a series just as the new season was about to begin. Box sets were also where the concept of binge watching a show originated. Why am I on there? Previously, you might have caught a marathon screening on television. You couldn't do that at your own pace as you would be able to do with a DVD box set. DVD box sets may have started to disappear, but the box set concept has stuck around. You don't get it? I get it. He drives a Lincoln. What? David Chase had been asked about when he would end the series, and he had to think about how things would play out. Officially, The Sopranos ran for six seasons, with the final season broadcast in two blocks of 12 and 9 episodes respectively. Unofficially, David Chase considers each block to be a season in its own right, but the split was a business decision from HBO to avoid having to renegotiate deals with the cast. Both blocks feel like seasons in their own right. By the end of the show, things are wrapped up, people die, or are clipped, a tit-for-tat war with New York after years of simmering tensions finally erupts with people falling left, right and centre. Things are eventually sorted out, but that final episode has an ending that seems to be building to something... Maybe Tony's going to be hit while eating a meal with his family in a diner and then... So this pissed off a lot of people. 
The Sopranos ended just before social media became the way people decided one episode ruined the entire series for them, but people still found a way to express their displeasure. David Chase refused to explain the ending, and people do what they always do in a vacuum. They suffocate, no, I mean, metaphorical vacuum of information. They just made things up. David Chase didn't want to have to explain himself, but at the same time, he would find some of the more outlandish fan theories to be as annoying as a Lego yoga mat. In a recent interview, Chase let slip that Tony was in fact dead. So... The furor over the Sopranos ending has subsided to the point where people have accepted it. But imagine if Star Trek The Next Generation had ended this way. Is there a problem, sir? Or The Office. I can't believe you came. Or even the video that you're watching right now. I loved you! What happens I decide, not you? Now you don't love me anymore, well that breaks my heart, but it's too fucking bad, because you don't gotta love me. But you will respect me. Like any long-running and successful series, The Sopranos has a lot of cameos from famous people. And more interestingly, soon-to-be-famous people. I mean, seriously, Lady Gaga? With so many people getting clipped or dying of natural causes, there are a lot of funerals, but very few weddings. The show could almost be called 40 f***ing funerals and a wedding, but Hugh Grant would have made a lousy Tony Soprano. You bought him now. What do you mean? There's been talk for a long time about some form of Soprano spin-off, and for a long time a prequel was mentioned. Well, this is finally set for release in 2021, as the movie The Many Saints of Newark, with the Punisher's John Bernthal playing Tony's dad, Anthony Soprano, as a young man in Newark. People see only what you allow them to see. When it began, The Sopranos looked like no other TV show on the air, and it got better with time as the production people got to know what worked and what didn't. It was a TV show that looked better than almost anything else on television at that time. One thing I could have lived without, and I don't think I'm alone in this, is the use of dream sequences. There are an awful lot of them, and sometimes they just seem to go on and on and on. Like Auntie Beryl after her hip surgery. Sometimes when she starts up, I just want to... Listen, Anthony, I'm, I'm not going to go out with you, okay? And it's not because you're unattractive or I don't think I would have a good time. It's just something I'm not going to do. The Sopranos writers room gave us Broadwalk Empire, Dexter, and Mad Men. More generally, The Sopranos really did change television and change it for the better. The concept of prestige television before The Sopranos was usually something like Twin Peaks or occasional acclaimed dramas like Lou Grant, Hill Street Blues, LA Law, ER, NYPD Blue. But they weren't always huge hits. The Sopranos showed that you could do a drama like a film with a decent budget and an excellent cast and you didn't need to censor it into a black hole to remove all the f**ks, cocks, tits, cuts and pussies in order to be palatable to network TV advertisers who themselves are a bunch of f**king pussies. It's gold-plated. If you had an Oscar, maybe I could give it a little something. An Academy Award, a TV. It really did show the way forward with a healthy budget, excellent cast, unfettered writers and directors. You'd think The Sopranos would have dated a lot more than it has, but now it just feels like a period drama that happened to be set in the 2000s, where DVDs with the coolest technology worth hijacking. It's finding a whole new appreciative audience every few years, which is the mark of truly great television. If you enjoyed this video, please fucking like and subscribe, leave a fucking comment below, or check out some of our other fucking videos. Universal remote put it down on darkened station